So my name is Mark Gluck. I'm a professor of neuroscience at Rutgers Newark. Uh, I also have a joint appointment in the School of Public Health, which is why I, I feel very proud to say I'm both a professor of neuroscience and public health. And I think that very much defines the scope of our lab is that it crosses from basic neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, computational neuroscience, but it also includes a lot of issues relevant to social work and to public health um, and neurology and uh, psychiatry. And as you'll see in a few minutes, also immunology. So it's a, we have a very interdisciplinary program. We actually have a lot of undergraduates. And uh, so part of the purpose of this presentation is to tell the undergraduates not only what we do, but to give a sense of what uh, undergraduates do in our lab. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about some of the undergraduate activities and opportunities. And I know that quite a few of the, of the past students, undergraduates in our lab have been MAPS students. So uh, MAPS program is, is familiar to us. Um, and I'm sure you can talk to some of your own MAPS students, but we usually have anywhere, I mean, obviously this last year has been exceptional um, and not the norm, but we often have about half a dozen undergraduates in our lab. Um, we also have a, a very diverse lab age-wise. We have people, um, I guess we have nobody younger than an undergraduate, um, but we have people uh, all the way up into their 70s and beyond who are from the community who come in and work with us on the research and also on the, uh, uh, especially on the community engagement and outreach. So it's, uh, there, there are both scientists and public health, but also lay people from the community. So I'm gonna jump in now. I'm gonna share my screen and, uh, so I want to talk today about Pathways to Healthy Aging in African Americans. That's the name for our longitudinal and cross-sectional and interventional studies that we're doing in Newark with older African Americans. This is a, a university community research study, and it links neuroscience, neurology, gerontology, and public health. Uh, and there's my name, my email, if you want to get in touch with me, and our websites, our two websites, our lab website uh, on the left, and then our more sort of public-facing website for community health. There's going to be five parts to my presentation today. Start by just giving you some uh, scientific and medical background on Alzheimer's disease in African Americans. Tell you about the Rutgers Aging and Brain Health Alliance, which is the, the, the entity within which we do all of this research. Um, tell you a lot about our community engagement in Greater Newark, so how it is that we go out in the community and provide value and also recruit participants. Give you a, an overview of some of the research findings that we've had over the last five years and then talk about some of our future directions, some of the, the scientific questions that we wanna answer. And uh, that latter is of course an opportunity for some of the students um, in the audience to think about projects that they might wanna come and get involved in. So two key questions. First, what is Alzheimer's disease? Cause we have a very broad and interdisciplinary audience here. So not everyone really knows what it is and why are African-Americans at high risk? So what is Alzheimer's disease? It's a disease that destroys our brain and gets worse over time. Um, early symptoms can be repeating oneself, difficulty with words, getting lost. And when these symptoms are so bad that they prevent someone from living independently, we say they have dementia. So people sometimes say, well, is it Alzheimer's or is it dementia? Um, and those are not uh, alternatives. Alzheimer's is a particular disease. Dementia describes the symptoms of being cognitively impaired. There are many things that can cause dementia, but Alzheimer's is the most common disease that causes the symptoms of dementia. What happens in the brain during Alzheimer's? Well, brain cells, which we call neurons, they die and they lose computing power. That's the essence of our cognition is these computing neurons, these brain cells. The connections between neurons break down. So the ability of one neuron to talk to another neuron begins to sort of fall apart. And as these neurons die, the brain shrinks and big gaps of space will start to appear. And the way we see these, the brain shrinking, the way we see these gaps is by using magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. So here you see on the right, there's a, a healthy brain, okay? Now, if we take someone who's got a fairly severe advanced case of Alzheimer's, what you'll see there is that um, the brain has really shrunk. It's clear there's been a lot of tissue that's been lost from all of this. What happens inside the brain? Well, on the left, you'll see some of these neurons, these brain cells, um, and that's a healthy brain. And on the right, you see a brain with Alzheimer's. And there are two things in particular to note. Um, and these we've known about for a hundred years since Dr. Alois Alzheimer in Munich discovered this um, from autopsy. And uh, one is what we call neurofibrillary tangles or, or, or tau. And this is breaking down of the structure inside the neurons. Okay, so it's inside the neurons or the tangles. 
and amyloid plaques, which is sort of junk that accumulates in the space between them. And those two, since the very beginning, um, are the, the signature pathology, the signature damage, the tangles and the plaques. Um, it used to be in Dr. Alwas Alzheimer's time, 100 years ago or so in Germany, um, you had to wait till autopsy. Then several decades ago, uh, people developed ways of, of in live people staining the brain with uh, a tracers uh, temporarily and then using PET imaging. But that PET imaging is very invasive. You have to get an injection. You need a tracer. Um, it can cost up to $10,000 know, a person to have this done. Um, so it was a very expensive way, but it would allow you to see some of the plaques and the tangles in the brain. Um, somewhat later became the, the advanced that you could actually begin to detect tangles and plaque from cerebral spinal fluid. So the fluid that flows out of the brain and into the spine. But to do that, you have to do a lumbar puncture. You have to put a needle into the spine. Um, and that's also somewhat invasive. So really the biggest advance in Alzheimer's research has come just this last year in 2020, when they finally figured out how to do, uh, to test for levels of these brain pathology from blood, um, which is a very common and, and relatively non-invasive way of testing for it. So that's been a huge advance. And for those of you who were around yesterday, we had a, a lecture in my lab that talked about um, how these blood tests are done and through our collaborators. And so we now work with a team in Sweden, in Gothenburg, Sweden, to be able to test for these plaques from blood samples. Um, and again, that's a huge advance now for research and in the coming years for clinical care as well. Why do some people get Alzheimer's disease and others don't? Well, partly it's genetics. Some genes that you inherit can increase or decrease your risk for Alzheimer's disease, but also lifestyle. There are risk factors such as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, poor sleep, sedentary behaviors, such as lack of physical exercise and lack of physical activity or exercise. All of these increase your risk for Alzheimer's. And just to let you be clear how much of a factor this is, people who are clinically obese um, or who have diabetes have twice the risk of Alzheimer's. So it's not like there's a small effect. These are huge effects of lifestyle. Um, so uh, the bottom line here is your by the way, somebody doesn't have their mute on, um, if they could mute themselves, thanks. Uh, your life choices matter for brain health, and that's really the bottom line here. Um, why are African-Americans at high risk? African-Americans have at least twice the risk, sometimes in some populations, three times the risk. They're also more likely to have severe symptoms, and we don't fully understand the reason for this health disparity. Um, it may be some, some combination of genetics, environment, and lifestyle. Um, and the reason we don't know exactly how these, all these factors interact is there's a lack of data on the brain changes that occur across the lifespan in older African-Americans. And that lack of data is the gap that our, our study is trying to fill. The good news is of all these various factors, particularly in terms of the health disparity for African-Americans having such high rates, it's probably mostly due to lifestyle, things we can change like fitness and sleep um, and uh, diet. And so, the good news is this health disparity is not unavoidable. And so by health education, by promoting healthy lifestyles, by providing opportunities for healthy lifestyles, we have a real opportunity to reduce the health disparity in particular to reduce the, the, the high rates of Alzheimer's in the black community. So let me just summarize for a moment what I, I've just covered in this first part of this talk. Alzheimer's disease causes dementia, which is the loss of the ability to think clearly. As the disease progresses, neurons die, the brain shrinks, and toxic junk and refuse accumulates both in and around the neurons. There are genetic, lifestyle, behavioral, and environmental contributors to risk for Alzheimer's disease, and these all interact in complex ways. And we do not yet understand fully why African Americans have a high rate of Alzheimer's disease, but certainly some of these lifestyle and behavioral factors are probably a very significant indicator, in part because we know that obesity and diabetes and hypertension um, are at very high levels in the Black community. So let me tell you a bit about the, the Rutgers Aging and Brain Health Alliance, what we have here at Rutgers in Newark. Uh, we have dual missions. We have two missions. They're both equally important. The first is community engagement. We want to promote brain health and Alzheimer's prevention for older African Americans in the greater Newark area. And we engage in brain health research. In Newark, we've been building a national center of excellence for research um, and training on community engaged approaches to aging and Alzheimer's disease in African-Americans. 
the Aging and Brain Health Alliance. We've had 15 years of university community partnerships promoting aging and brain health. So we've been doing community work for about 15 years, but only in the last five years have we begun to sort of build on the first decade of community involvement to build a research program. Our university participants include faculty and students from neuroscience, neurology, public health, immunology, kinesiology, um, and we welcome undergraduates um, as well as graduate students from all of these programs and backgrounds. Um, and we have community members, quite a few of whom are, are here at this presentation today, who come from local churches, senior center, and from federally assisted housing. And so we work with the, the, the members and the, the management and the leadership of these various community organizations. We have a, a, a global uh, set of uh, collaborations. Uh, one of our uh, main collaborations over the last years is at UC Irvine in California, with whom we collaborate on our brain imaging research and our sleep research. Um, and we're just beginning now this month collaborations with the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, who will be analyzing all of the, uh, the blood for these biomarkers to, to pick up uh, evidence from blood uh, that people do or don't have the, the amyloid and the tangles in their brain. So to summarize, Uh, uh, our program is based on linking community engagement to brain health research. Uh, we have multiple units within Rutgers, which furthers both our research, our scholarship, and our community service goals. Newark is now recognized internationally as a center for research on pathways to healthy aging in African Americans. Um, and in the summer of 2022, we will be hosting a national conference on research and re um, risk and resilience to Alzheimer's disease in African Americans. And for those of you who are still around, we hope uh, that you'll come join us for this meeting. Let me turn now to talk about our community engagement in Greater Newark. What are the various ways in which we engage with the community, both to promote public health, to, to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's locally, but also then to turn and recruit people. So there are four aspects I'll tell you about. Where our key strategies for engagement and recruitment, our community engagement team, many of whom are, are attending this presentation, an overview of some of the different kinds of programs that we run in the community, and finally, our community stakeholders board. So um, we have a number of key strategies that uh, are, are really the fundamentals in, in terms of how we, we operate in the community. We build trust through long-term relationships that focus on bringing value to the community. We formalize community involvement through a community stakeholders board. We disseminate health information through trusted community leaders, several of whom are here today. We recruit older men through targeted efforts because it's always been a struggle to get enough older black men into our studies. And we cultivate research participants as ambassadors for recruitment. Um, and at this point, while well, we've been doing research for about five years in the community, about a third, a quarter to a third of the people who contact us come not because of our outreach, but because a friend or a family member who had participated told them. So we think of that as sort of viral marketing. We have good customers and the customers spread uh, the word of mouth about our programs. And, and it's also evidence to us that people are, are happy and, and, and about their involvement with the research study because they are telling their friends and encouraging their friends to participate. Um, we engage community members to communicate the importance of uh, participating. And we make a point of sharing scientific results with the community so that uh, once they're part of our study, we continue to educate them not only about brain health and Alzheimer's in general, but we want them to see exactly what their participation is leading to, the papers and the publications um, and the coverage. Uh, we have a, an extensive community engagement team. Uh, these are some of the people here. Um, some are, are in the, uh, the audience now. Um, and they range uh, from, many of them have lived in the community for years um, and are involved with our relationships with churches, doing community health education um, and uh, uh, being out, particularly in our relationships with public housing. And so this is just some of the people who are uh, critically involved in our outreach. Uh, they really are, are the, the key, the glue that, that connects us to the community. We've been working for 15 years um, with community partners to improve brain health and reduce Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and these are just a bit of a photo gallery that shows you sort of what some of these events are like when we go out in the community. Um, our community brain health programs, uh, pre-COVID, the main ones that we did were uh, programs that we called Aging Smart, how to keep your brain healthy, stay sharp, and avoid Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, and these we present as lunch and learns. Uh, our basic approach to community engagement is first we feed people a brain healthy meal. And then when they're happy and well fed, um, then we begin to present some of the educational programs. And all of our educational programs are aging smart programs that we were doing pre-COVID as sort of lunch, lunch and learns uh, have a very simple message, actually six simple messages. We encourage people to exercise regularly, to challenge their brain, to manage stress, to get a good night's sleep, to socialize with others, and to eat a healthy diet, including the, 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 the lunch that we always will provide. Um, that was our main sort of pre-COVID type of programming in the community, at churches, at senior centers, in public and federally subsidized housing. Um, we also have a pamphlet that takes these six steps and uh, explains them in more detail. And we distribute these widely at all of our events. It's also, um, and so it's a way that we can sort of have an even a wider impact by getting the message out in print. Um, we have a, uh, we're particularly interested in, the, in what we call exceptional African-American superagers. The demographics with African-Americans and aging and Alzheimer's is bad, as I told you, it's, it's, it's not promising. They're two to three times the rate of Alzheimer's, but demographics isn't destiny. Just because you belong to a group that has overall on average, there are many people who are exceptions. And we're particularly interested in those people who are African-Americans, but who've gotten to the, their 80s or their 90s or beyond, and they have superior cognitive ability. You know, their minds and their brains are functioning you know, on the level of somebody 30 years younger. And we think of these people as, as long distance memory athletes. They've gone a long distance in, in, in the temporal domain um, and their memories are fabulous. And we think these people are worth uh, honoring and recognizing to hold them up as role models. So, so that people say, hey, if they can do it in 80s and 90s, why can't I? So the people, people see them a model, but we're also interested in them because uh, there's a clue we hope by understanding them, by bringing them into our research studies, can we learn from them? What, are the, what is it about them that allowed them to get through so much of their life and become exceptional? And so we have these events. Um, you'll see that was, a, a, that was a, uh, an event we had Tuesday, February 25th, 2020. Obviously that was one of the last events we did before COVID. Um, and you'll see some of our five super agers there with the plaques that we give them that are hanging up and their umbrellas, the umbrellas that we give them um, all say have uh, uh, neuroscience and brain health. And then it says, we've got your brain covered as our sort of umbrella motto. And uh, each of these five people gave a talk and they talked about their lives, their brain health tips, um, why they participated in research. And it was really just a very compelling uh, presentation to see these people who sort of live, live a sort of a brain healthy lifestyle and, and what that's done for them. Um, men have always been a challenge. Uh, men don't tend to come as often to the churches where we do a lot of our recruitment. They tend to be uh, resistant to health education um, and resistant to research. So uh, we've been working very hard over the last few years, uh, particularly with a, a network of uh, men's ministries with the local churches um, to do men's specific programming. And uh, we have uh, one event uh, was about turbocharging your brain and building a superhero strong memory. Every man is a superhero in his own mind. Um, and we also uh, have been running car shows for many years. I'm also a, a classic car collector. Uh, that's my car, a, a vintage Citroën Traction Avant in the lower left corner of that flyer. So I have a lot of uh, classic car friends around the region. Um, and so we've created Newark's uh, only, first and only uh, classic car show. And it's a free classic car show and barbecue. And then the men come for that. And then we have a lot of men's health information there. So we sort of bring the men in for uh, the cars and uh, hopefully they'll get a little bit of brain health uh, information at the same time. Hey, you. you might notice. Can you hear the audio? Yes. Can you hear the audio okay? Good. These are some of the events that we've been doing over the past couple of years. Yeah, so what's life? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I was asked to take care of my grandmother. I went to take care of her and I took care of her every day. Each time uh, the AABHI puts on an event, there's always something to learn. My enjoyment is to see the residents that are really in the underdeserved population. My enjoyment is to see them come and to see them learn about Alzheimer's. This type of event is so necessary 
for all of us because maybe one day we can put Alzheimer's behind us. So we're having a, a classic car show and men's brain health fair combined for the first time here at Rutgers University Newark and the purpose is to reach out to men who traditionally don't come to health education events with local churches with their men's ministry. Okay, so that gives you a sense of some of the kind of events that we've done in the community. Um, and, uh, but of course, those kinds of car shows and uh, the lunch and learns and everything haven't been possible for the last year. So what have we done over the last year of COVID? Um, a lot of people's con health concerns, of course, have shifted from being worried about Alzheimer's and dementia to being worried about the more proximal risk of COVID. So we've had four COVID era virtual programs that I'll tell you about. Um, and we do these both by Zoom and by phone um, because we know a lot of our, the members of the community uh, don't have internet access. So we try to make everything that they can Zoom. If they have internet access, they can Zoom in and see the visuals, but we also make it possible that those without internet can just call in. So the first has been exercise classes uh, that we run and we're still running them on Wednesdays and Fridays. And this is really important because exercise we know is not only important for brain health, it's important for immune health. And so there's this uh, paradox that people stay home to avoid the virus, to avoid getting COVID, but as they stay home, they become sedentary, they don't exercise, they don't walk, and in doing that, their immune system becomes weaker. So uh, we try to very much reach out to people, uh, provide them with opportunities at home by phone or Zoom to stay fit, not only for their brain health, but their immune health. A lot of questions in the community about COVID-19. We've been running a series of uh, videos and programs. Uh, these videos and programs, of course, have evolved as our knowledge has evolved. Um, and particularly more recently, as vaccines have become available, we've developed programs on vaccine education. Um, and these programs are always uh, available either on the web where they can go and see our videos, but we also do Zoom presentations, live events, particularly at churches where uh, people can come. We'll show a video and we'll have some of our community brain health educators, uh, some of the people from the the Center for Immunology at Rutgers uh, Medical School come and answer questions. So both online, but also by Zoom with sort of a mixture of video and live. Um, we have a, a new video, uh, which is just released last week, um, as the vaccines have become available, a video we created where we, we took, uh, we interviewed eight of the local pastors, and we asked them to speak to us on video about what are they telling their congregation, what are they telling their family, and what are their own plans? Um, and this video is on our website. Um, it's gonna be combined with some of the science and health education. And we're gonna be starting a, a series of, of Zoom and phone programming uh, with the local churches and with some of the public and subsidized housing to combine the science and health information with uh, hearing from these community faith-based leaders, what they're doing and what they're telling people. And finally, Bible study in the brain um, uh, is we have a, a, a Somebody, somebody, please mute themselves so I don't have to go find you and mute you. Thanks. Uh, so uh, this is a, a guide that I wrote. I was actually challenged by one of the pastors, uh, the pastor of Metropolitan Baptist Church. He said to me at the end of meeting, he says, so I have this problem. A lot of my members are, uh, particularly our older members, they come to Bible study every Wednesday. Uh, they learn a passage and by the next day, they've forgotten it all. He says they have a real trouble sort of memorizing passage. Can you help? Um, and although I, I knew nothing about the Bible, um, I do know something about memory and memory tips and, and memory tricks, how to memory. And so I worked with a local pastor, our director of church relations, Reverend uh, Dr. Glenn Wilson. And together we took the science of, of, of memory and combined it with uh, uh, a knowledge of the Bible. And we created this Bible study guide, the neuroscience of Bible study, 10 practical tips from brain science for memorizing scripture. So again, it's about taking the science taking the neuroscience, uh, the brain health, and sort of applying it to the problems and the issues of people in the community. Um, and this has been a very popular, um, both for churches use it themselves for their brain, uh, for their Wednesday Bible studies, or we send uh, two of the pastors who are part of our engagement team who do uh, uh, sort of a guest presentation on this material at a Bible study. And lastly, Aging Smart. This is the same kind of lunch and learn programs that we did in the past, but during COVID, there's no lunch, it's just learning. Um, but again, we do these by COVID. So four different programs that have sort of occupied us as we've, we've worked during the COVID era to provide brain health and uh, immune health information to the community. 
We have a community stakeholders board, uh, which we've been building out over the last year and a half. Um, we call it a community stakeholders board rather than an advisory board, which is a more common term, because we don't think of the community members as people who are advising us, but rather they're more like stockholders in a joint program. Um, and so uh, we formalize this relationship with a memorandum of understanding that the community leaders sign and I sign. So it ensures full transparency. They know what I'm committing to. They know that what we're expecting of them, they know what they can expect from us. So let me tell you a bit about what is this memorandum of understanding that we signed with all the community organizations. So in this jointly signed uh, MOU, we commit um, at our end to a number of things, to safeguard the health and well-being of participants as our top priority, to seek and incorporate community input into our planning for research and for community programming, to offer complete transparency, including shares, sharing copies of our grant proposals, research protocols, papers, and results, whatever we have in the lab, uh, we're completely transparent and happy to share it. Um, to use our financial resources, we bring in uh, a fair amount of money from grants. We've raised over $7 million in the last five years, uh, mostly from the NIH, but from the New Jersey Department of Health. Um, we use that, we commit to using that money as much as possible to support the community. We hire, we have quite a number of people in our lab from the community, particularly older residents who we hire. We purchase from local businesses. We provide support to community organizations. And we also donate to a lot of uh, community programming that is specific for older, older members of the community. So we're trying to use our resources, not only to fund the research, but to sort of enhance the brain health programming and, and the well-being um, of the residents. We offer science training and career advancement to uh, our community leaders. Uh, once they're part of our stakeholders board, uh, it's essentially like going back to, to school. We're, we're inviting them to all sorts of lectures and seminars so that uh, in addition to the, the main community education programs, the leaders of these organizations, the representatives on the stakeholders board um, are invited to a lot of the same things that our students and our graduate students come to. So this is really like a continuing education program for them um, when they're part of this uh, stakeholders board. Uh, we, we commit to compensating participants fairly and adequately. Uh, whenever we ask people to come in, uh, we pay them for their time um, so that they are are generously uh, and appropriately compensated for whatever we're asking of them. Uh, we share our fundraising experience and grantmanship skills. This wasn't something I had ex ex expected to do, um, uh, but it was it turned out to be something that we could offer. Um, as people saw the fundraising that we were doing, the churches or, or, or senior centers who are also trying to raise money would come to me and ask for advice, uh, how to write this grant, you know, could I read over a proposal and so forth. And so now we've sort of broadcast you know, to our stakeholders that as they seek to sort of raise funding for their own programs at the church or the senior center, you know, we have a lot of experience in fundraising and we try to sort of share that with them so they can build up their own organizations. Um, of our community partners, we're very explicit about what we ask. We ask them to participate in board meetings um, and post COVID, we promise there'll be a lot of good brain healthy food. To host brain health education programs at their site. Uh, at the moment, we're doing it with Zoom uh, through their programs, but soon we hope to go back and do insight, lunch and learns, and other programming. To communicate research opportunities to the members, uh, we ask the stakeholders to sort of use this infrastructure that we're building and, and use the programming as a way to let people know about the research. And to provide us with feedback and guidance. We want to hear from them candidly and completely and quickly. You know, are there things that they like? Are there things there are problems with? Are there issues? You know, we want their input on how to guide both the programming and the research to best serve the community. And we ask them to stay informed about brain health and aging. I mentioned that you know, when people join the Community Stakeholders Board, we sort of give them access to sort of a continuing education program on brain health and education, both for their own edification, but also that makes them more able to be a partner with us in, in determining what we do and where things go. And last, for those who are particularly interested, we, we encourage people to get involved in planning community events. So some of the various people in the community have gotten involved in the classic car show, for example, or in our super ager program. So for those members of the community board, community stakeholders board, who are, are particularly interested in having a, an even larger role, uh, there are a number of opportunities. So that's what we commit to from uh, on Rutgers behalf and what we ask of our community partners. So let me summarize part three. Uh, with appropriate community engagement, older African Americans will enroll in research on aging and brain health. And a lot of people will say, and you see written that African, older African Americans, African Americans in general, uh, older African Americans won't participate in research. 
Uh, we think our programs in Newark uh, show that that's not the case, that in fact, we can enroll large numbers. We've had over 400 people from the community uh, who have enrolled in our studies. We have over 300 in our, our longitudinal cohort. So uh, uh, our efforts show that with appropriate community engagement, older African-Americans will enroll in research on aging and brain health. And we invite many of our colleagues in so sociology, social work, and public health to work with us to help understand what does and doesn't work to promote uh, research involvement in the community. Uh, a community engagement team with deep understanding of the community is essential. You saw a list of, I think whether it was eight or 10 people uh, that I showed before. You heard Glenda Wright speaking in that video earlier, telling you about uh, some of why she's involved in the program. You know, these community engagement teams are really, you know, the essence that, that bridges from our lab to the community. Uh, regular Absolutely. That brings Absolutely, up, very that, important. That that was Glenda. Thank you, Glenda. <laughs> you that, was, that was Glenda piping in. I uh, I can't see her, but I know her voice. You recognize yes. it as well from the video. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, our regular programming. Our, our our goal is to bring value to the community. You know, I think you know people trust you when they not only see you around for 15 years, but when there's a long history of leaving behind a trail of positive impact on the community. So uh, that's one of the things we're sort of always looking at, whether it's helping our community partners write grants for their own programs, um, or whether it's improving brain health, uh, or helping support some of the various other programming that they're doing. Uh, we look for uh, a, a long history of regular programming that brings value. The Community Stakeholders Board that I described and the written MOU gives partners a voice um, and establishes a commitment to transparency. So those are key. Let me tell you a bit now about some of the research that we've done, you know, this aging and brain health research. So you have a sense about the, where does all this now fit into the, the story of the, the neuroscience of aging? Uh, we call the program, the Pathways to Healthy Aging in African-Americans. Uh, we focus uh, not on people who have Alzheimer's. Uh, we, so we are an Alzheimer's research program, but our interest is not in studying people with Alzheimer's, uh, but rather in asking how do we avoid getting Alzheimer's? So we're interested in, the pathways from people who are still cognitively healthy and intact, how can they stay that way or even improve their brain health? It's very much a university community collaboration. Since 2015, when we began the research component, uh, we began the outreach in 2006, we've enrolled over 400 local older African-Americans from greater Newark into various studies and over 300 into our longitudinal study. Um, we've had funding from the National Institutes of Health the Office of Minority Health, the New Jersey Department of Health's Office of Minority and Multicultural Health. So we have a lot of supporters as well as from private funding um, that supports some of our work. Who is eligible to participate? Uh, who are the people we're looking to enroll? Uh, they identify as African-American or black regardless of where they or their parents were born. Age 60 or older. They speak English fluently, and that's important because a lot of the cognitive testing and other questionnaires that we do are all in English. Um, and we note that we do not enroll people who already have dementia or serious memory impairments. Uh, we study healthy aging and how to prevent Alzheimer's. And we have to sort of emphasize this because a lot of people say, oh, it's a memory research program. You know, my dad, he's, he's got dementia and memory problems. I wanna bring him and be part of your study. And we have to say that, you know, we can help guide you to clinical care but our goal is to sort of enroll people who are still uh, cognitively healthy and ask how do we get people to stay that way and uh, improve brain health. Um, during COVID, uh, we've just opened up this week. Um, we actually, this week, we've collected our first uh, participant in an entire year. We've spent the last year doing community engagement, writing research grants, writing papers. Fortunately, we had many years worth of data to still dive into. So it's been a very busy year. Uh, but up until this week, we haven't collected any data um, and we're just beginning to enroll people. The question being, how do we protect everyone we enroll? How do we protect everyone on our staff and the community from COVID if we're beginning to bring them back now? So the first is all participants must be fully vaccinated two weeks since the last dose. Um, so we ensure that everyone who comes in um, has full vaccine immunity. For those who haven't gotten a vaccine yet but are seeking it, um, we work with churches that have healthcare navigators. Um, <laughs> to help people. So we have a program to uh, um, we have a program to uh, um, we have a, oops, sorry we have a program to help people find uh, uh, vaccinations. Um, we give participants a COVID <laughs> a 
Hi. Can we ask Rosalie, could you mute yourself? So I, I have a problem there. Thank you so much. Um, we give participants a COVID-19 infection test prior to beginning our studies. Um, and we only move forward with the rest of the studies um, if that person is negative. So we're sure that everyone who's coming through our studies is, is COVID negative. Um, uh, all research staff um, is vaccinated. So everyone who works in the community, whether they're doing community engagement or whether they're in the lab, um, are fully vaccinated. Oops, sorry. Um, and we now have moved, we used to do a lot of our testing in the small testing rooms at the university. Um, we've now do um, all of our main testing off campus in a large, well-ventilated church fellowship hall at Pilgrim Baptist Church in Newark which has private parking. So they're not going through hallways, they're not interacting with other people, and it's a large, well-ventilated space. The only time people actually come onto our campus is for the brain imaging, which we can't bring out to the community. So all of these together are our ways of uh, 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 keeping everyone, our staff and the community members safe, and it's all approved by the university's research office. Oh, and everyone wears a mask and follows PPE. So. What do research participants do in our study? Well, there are three visits. The first visit, uh, which takes about half an hour, is at the New Jersey Medical School in Newark. Um, we collect saliva um, in order for us to test for uh, both genetics and for cur current infection status, so as to protect our staff. And we do a blood test, which allows us to look at brain health, to immune health, um, and also to check for diabetes. So that's the important first step. Once somebody has uh, shown us that they're, they're COVID negative, once we've done the test, they're COVID negative, um, they come back on another day and it takes about two and a half hours at the church where we do health tests and fitness tests, physical fitness tests, cognitive and lifestyle assessments. This is sort of our core understanding of someone's cognition, memory, lifestyle, and health. And then they come back on the third day to the Rutgers Newark where we do brain imaging, which is critical to actually see their brain see what's connected um, and, and, and actually directly measure their brain health. Um, and then if for those who are interested, we're also very much involved, interested in understanding how sleep affects memory. Um, and there's an optional week of home sleep monitoring using digital sleep monitors. Uh, for people who participate, uh, they can earn up to $200 plus a transportation allowance. So it's part of our sort of putting money out into the community uh, to compensate people fairly for their time. Um, and then we repeat every two years, or every year if once somebody turns 80. So our goal isn't just to have people come in once, but uh, to have them come in really for the rest of their life so that we can track how their brain and their health um, and their memory and cognition changes over time. So as people enroll in this study, as they become what we call VIPs, very important participants um, in, in brain health, we want them to be our sort of our friend and partner for life. And uh, one of the reasons why we're constantly uh, reaching out not only to the community in general, but to our VIPs of whom we have about 300 now, constantly staying in touch, sending them things, inviting them to special events. So once you enroll in our research study, you become one of our VIPs and we try to treat you like you think a VIP should be treated um, with a lot of special care. Uh, we make sure that everybody understands their rights as a research participant and that they understand you know, that we are committed to these, right, re, the, these rights, that results are private, confidential, and anonymous. People's names are never used or made public. Participation is voluntary at any point at the, at, at the time they can stop, okay, from the beginning to the end. And all research is reviewed and approved by community members for safety. Um, so nothing that we can do is done um, unless the, the broader research program is, is uh, approved by our stakeholders board and the details are approved by an internal review board. There are a number of benefits to participating with permission, uh, with someone's permission, we can provide copies of the brain imaging and other health tests to a participant's doctor. This is a really useful because uh, if you get sick in two years or four years down the line, um, it's important for doctors to be able to look back and see how you were in the past years. Um, if on future visits, two, four, or six years from now, someone shows sign of dementia, um, we will pay for someone to get a full clinical dementia assessment. So I said, we don't enroll people who have dementia, um, but we know that, uh, you know, of these very people, a certain fraction will develop dementia in the coming years. And if so, we have a protocol in place to, base, to pay for a complete uh, sort of top of the line clinical assessment so that we and they know exactly what's, what's going on. Uh, there are also community benefits. Uh, understanding how African-Americans age, people who participate are contributing to our broader understanding. 
Uh, they're contributing to reducing the high rate and cost of Alzheimer's disease in African Americans. They're contributing to providing training opportunities for young scientists and health professionals from the community, including, of course, the students in the MAPS program who are hosting this talk today. What did the skills learn? Okay, so this is sort of the bottom line for those who are the undergraduates who are here who are saying, well, what am I going to get out of this? How will, I, uh, how will I grow if I participate as an undergraduate intern? So here are some of the skills which, uh, which uh, our interns come away with. Uh, they learn to administer cognitive health and fitness assessments, to run functional MRI brain imaging scans. We have undergraduates who get trained to go into the imaging center, learn how to uh, uh, bring someone in and, and do the imaging, to summarize and present research papers at lab meetings. Our undergraduates are regularly giving presentations both in the lab and outside, learning to communicate science, which is an essential part um, of any health career, whether it's research or clinical, to present posters at scientific and academic conferences. Uh, we encourage and we support financially our undergraduates to go to uh, local and sometimes even uh, you know, national conferences to present their research. Um, this is usually not in their first semester in the lab, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, we don't take anyone in the lab past the first semester um, of their junior year. So we, we expect a three semester commitment um, uh, we'd much rather get people in their sophomore year so they can be here longer uh, because it's really only by your third semester in the lab that you're at the point where you are able to present posters at scientific and academic conferences or summarize and present papers. So uh, we're really looking to get students in their sophomore or at the beginning of their junior year so that they can make a long-term commitment to us and we can make a long-term commitment to their academic and career growth. Um, students are very much involved uh, what we do is expensive. You know, as I mentioned, we've raised about $7 million. Um, we're constantly putting out research grants um, and uh, the students get involved. You learn about fundraising. You learn about how do you explain your work? How do you pitch your work? How do you understand what a different agency or, or funder is interested in and how to tailor your, your presentation to them? So applying for research grants or any kind of grant is a really important skill. Managing relationships with community leaders. Uh, uh, many of our uh, interns, particularly those who come from, uh, who have an interest in minority health, work with Glenda, who you saw and who you heard from, uh, and Dolores and uh, Reverend Wilson, uh, work with them in their outreach, in their programming in the community. So one of the things that uh, our in students learn by being part of this outreach is they learn from, uh, not just from me, but from Glenda and Reverend Wilson and Dolores, learn how to deal with these community leaders and community organizations. And last, to teach community health education programs, where whether it's uh, COVID and immune health these days or, or, or brain health or cognitive health, um, we want our undergraduates to get involved and through that learn how to do health education, uh, not to scientists and not to uh, 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 medical staff, but rather into the general community. So I think that's all seven. So uh, those are some of the skills which our undergraduates you know, who stick with us through the three semesters can come away with. Oh, and finally, to participate in interdisciplinary collaboration. So as you've seen, our lab has people from public health, sociology, immunology, neurology, psychiatry, neuroscience. So uh, all these people are involved in our lab. Um, and so you begin to see, uh, the students begin to see how, how science and medicine and health research doesn't just depend on, on, on one degree and one specialty, but by being able to draw in from many of these different areas. And I think that's a, a really important lesson because it encourages uh, the undergraduates to think about not just learning one thing, but to learn uh, many different areas that they can bring together in unique ways. Um, one of the things that we're doing is, is creating a really important database on the brain changes in older African-Americans as they age. Uh, there's a real lack of data because there's been a lack of participation. Uh, one of our contributions to the field uh, and, and to health is building up the, this, this brain imaging database across the lifespan in older African-Americans. Uh, we do, we were doing before COVID and we will afterwards. We're very interested in interventions, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So the question is, what can you do that will improve your brain health and reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease? Um, once uh, probably in the fall or perhaps in January, we'll begin again to do some of these exercise research studies. Uh, they'll involve uh, community members in our study who uh, agree to be part of exercise programs three times a week in the community led by certified instructors. That's Lisa Charles there, who uh, is leading both our, our COVID era remote exercise classes and was involved in a lot of our exercise classes. Uh, beforehand, uh, we look at people before and after six months. We say, if, 
if we take someone who's otherwise sedentary, often obese, they have other co comorbidities, um, if they can commit to three months, six months of three times a week exercise uh, for about an hour each, how is that going to change their brain? And so we look at them, their cognitive and brain health before exercise, we look at it after. Um, and we're interested moving forward in asking some questions about how do different exercise, the stretching and toning, um, how does that differ from a sort of a more cardio or dance-based exercise? So there are a lot of important questions and we will be sort of moving forward um, with people from collaborators from the kinesiology uh, program at Rutgers in doing sort of the next phase of these studies. Um, and our goal is really to ask for older African-Americans, how do different forms of exercise improve brain health and memory in different people? So uh, uh, for those of you who've been sitting for the last 45 minutes or so, I invite you all to stand up. I've been standing up throughout this whole presentation. So can you. Um, and I'm going to show you just about, well, there it is. There's uh, Ms. White. I see you standing up. I, don't, I can't see all of you, um, but I see uh, some of you have stood up. Um, and you can follow along while Crystal Gaynor, one of our instructors, leads one of our cardio dance exercise classes. Okay, so that's a, a brief uh, sample um, of what some of these exercise, these cardio dance fitness exercise classes have been like um, over the last year. And just think about doing that three times a week uh, for at least six months. Although many people who joined us for the six month study stayed on even longer. So what have we discovered so far? People often say, okay, so you're doing this research, you get the people in, you take the blood, you take the cognitive, you do the fitness, you do all of this. So what, what does that tell us? So let me show you just briefly. I'm obviously, this is, there's not enough time. We're coming close to the end here. Um, there's uh, a lot of not, uh, not enough time to go into the details of the science. At another time, I'm happy to share with people the science, but let me give you sort of a broad, uh, sort of superficial sort of a, a roadmap of some of the kinds of things we've discovered. Um, you can get all of our publications. Um, as we said, we're full transparency. Everything we've published can be found on our, our webpage under publications. Um, We've, uh, so here I'm gonna give you a brief run through of some of the papers we've published. Uh, this was a study back in 2018 that looked at how genetics for Alzheimer's is affecting people's ability to discriminate different things in their environment and, and the activity in their brain. So we're interested in these links between genetics and hippocampal uh, and, and sort of brain circuits for memory. Um, and part of the reason is because genetics do vary between racial groups, the ways in which these genes affect health do vary, and there's very little data about how some of these Alzheimer's risk genes um, uh, affect health in, in African Americans, and we've been filling that gap. Um, we've looked at a particular gene called ABCA7, which is very poorly understood um, and has been particularly implicated um, in risk factors for brain health and Alzheimer's in those of African descent. We've looked at how this gene is associated with brain activity and cognition. Um, we've tried to review it and make people more aware of some of the differences in these genes in African-Americans. Um, we've particularly tried to show how, uh, the most, most recently we've been showing how some of these genes um, affect the degree to which physical fitness um, protects your brain, both the physical fitness across people um, and uh, more recently in this paper, which just came out showing that some of these genes affect who does or doesn't benefit from exercise. So people often say, well, is my brain health depend on the genes or does it depend on my behavior? And the answer is, uh, they interact so that uh, what we've shown is that uh, physical fitness, particularly exercise, can be tremendous in improving your brain health, in improving your memory and your cognition, your ability to, to learn in one situation and generalize to another. But the degree to which somebody's brain benefits from exercise is not the same from one person to the next. Um, and what we've shown is that uh, there are certain genes which modulate the degree to which exercise protects the brain. And that's important because this may lead in the future to getting an exercise prescription based on your genetics. So the idea is that uh, rather than saying one type of exercise, one amount of exercise is what you need to protect the brain, perhaps if we know someone's individual genetics, we may be able to fine tune that to make an individualized exercise prescription. It's also important to know because as we understand how this particular gene modulates the effects of exercise on the brain, um, that gives molecular biologists and others the opportunity to try to 
learn more about this gene because something about what this gene does is involved in the pathway by which exercise affects the brain. So just understanding how genes affect the exercise brain health linkage gives us a, a, a window into understanding how and where exercise is affecting the brain. Um, and this is another study. Uh, a lot of our work has shown that the medial temporal lobe, it's, it's where the, the memories are first stored. It's, it's what we call the gateway to memory. It's where new information comes into the brain. It goes to the medial temporal lobe. It's also called the hippocampus is the main brain region. And what we've shown is that in people who are, are healthy um, and, and, and cognitively sharp, um, that their brain is very dynamic and flexible, that different parts of the brain talk to other parts of the brain briefly, and then they cut off and they talk to other parts of the brain. So it's, it's like a, a cocktail party. Uh, the healthy brains are like a cocktail party where you go in and you, you chat with one people about one topic. And then a few minutes later, you chat with other people. And it's a, a very dynamic party. In contrast, people whose brains are beginning to, to transition towards Alzheimer's, where they're their, their, uh, their brains are, they're beginning to have trouble with memory and, and trouble uh, learning, that their brains become more rigid. Their brains, the pieces of their brain become like the kind of party where you get stuck talking at the table to the same person all night long, and you talk about the same thing all night long, and you never get to meet all the other guests at the party. So that sort of rigid connectivity is what we see um, in people whose brains are not as healthy. And what was most exciting about some of our exercise studies is we showed that we could take people who began the study with sort of rigid brains, brains that are like the boring cocktail parties where each part of the brain is stuck talking to the same part the whole, all the time. And we've shown that after six months, not only is they getting more cardiovascular, not only are their bodies getting more flexible because they're learning all these fabulous dance routines, but their brain is getting more flexible. The different parts of their brain that used to be sort of stuck together in terms of who talks to who, now suddenly are able to connect and reconnect and sort of dynamically and flexibly connect to various parts of the brain as needed. So we've really been able to see um, how exercise is literally rewiring the brain and rewiring it in terms of making it easier for parts of the brain to communicate widely with other parts of the brain. And that's, that's how we sort of link up exercise and fitness with genetics, with understanding something about brain function, structure, and connectivity. Uh, some of our work was uh, recently featured in the New York Times, um, and uh, there's a link to this article here, um, but where we're really trying to understand uh, how it is that exercise is enhancing aging brains. And that photo, uh, you'll see Crystal, who you'll recognize from the video, this was taken at St. James Church, which was uh, probably one of the most beautiful settings for an exercise class that I've seen. As I mentioned, uh, over the last five years, we've raised about uh, over $7 million. In fact, this slide is a couple of weeks late. It's actually closer to $8 million now because we just got a new award to study the effects of COVID on brain health. Um, so we have a new award that just came literally in the last week where we're gonna be trying to ask, we know COVID-19 has had a devastating effect on the black community, particularly on older African-Americans, um, but we don't know how it's affecting their brain short term or long term. So we have a new grant from NIH, um, which okay. can help us understand that. So uh, that's some of our, our research here. Let me give you a brief summary and uh, uh, talk about what we've done. We now have over 300 African Americans from Greater Newark, ages 16 above, enrolled as participants in our term study. They return every two years or every one year once they're 80. The current testing protocol includes multiple layers of protection from COVID-19 infection for both our staff and participants. Everyone has to be vaccinated before they can be part. Uh, participation results in both individual health benefits and benefits to the community. And uh, I've briefly given you a tour of six of our recent publications, and you can read more about it in the New York Times uh, article, which is on our webpage. Um, and we've raised now close to $8 million, which is both funding this research, funding our community engagement, um, and allowing us to put not only uh, community value in, but also try to sort of put as much of that money as possible into the community. Um, let me sort of wind up here, just briefly tell you some of the future directions. Um, if you're a, a sophomore or a freshman um, and you're thinking about getting involved in the lab, um, then uh, these are some of the projects that you might be working on over the next couple of years. Um, our goal is to enroll 120 new participants a year, uh, um, as well as bringing back all the other people every two years. And our goal um, over the next uh, five years, uh, five, seven years, is to get up to a cohort of 1,000. We already have in Newark one of the largest studies of aging in African-Americans in the country. 
Um, we hope in the next five years, if we can get our cohort to 1,000 people, um, it will overwhelmingly be the most important sort of aging study in African Americans. So here are nine key questions. So we have a, a five-year plan um, as we get up to this sort of enrolling 1,000 people. Here are nine key questions that we would like to try to uh, find the answers to with participation from students and participation from community members who enroll in the study. The first is, how did individual differences in health and lifestyle affect cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease in our older African-Americans? That's really the fundamental question behind much of what we do. Which aspects of cognition and brain function can be improved through regular exercise? And what kind of exercise is best? How does sleep affect risk for Alzheimer's disease? And how does early Alzheimer's disease affect sleep? That's why we ask people at the end of the, the main part of the study to do a week of home sleep monitoring so we can relate everything else that we're studying, uh, brain health and cognition and fitness um, uh, to uh, sleep. What can we learn about successful aging from exceptional African-American superagers who have superior cognitive abilities on par with somebody 30 years younger? So we're always looking for the best and the brightest of those who are 80 and 90 to be part of our study um, and let us both honor them and recognize them, but also learn from them. Five, I wish I just mentioned, we had this, this new grant from NIH, which we got last week. For those who were infected during COVID-19 pandemic, what are the long-term consequences for their brain health um, and for their risk for Alzheimer's disease? We know that COVID-19 has a lot of neurological consequences, um, uh, but we don't really know what they are um, or how they relate to the changes that one might see in Alzheimer's disease. The only way we can do that is to enroll people who've had COVID-19 ranging from asymptomatic to mild to moderate to severe and hospitalized and following them in the long term. And a related question is how do changes in immunological health across the lifespan, especially the decline of immune cell function relate to the uh, progression of Alzheimer's disease? There's a, a growing understanding that uh, Alzheimer's disease to some degree may be thought of as an autoimmune disorder where the brain's immune system is either attacking parts of the brain or failing to clear out um, some of the toxic waste in the brain. Um, and that's intimately involved with the functions of the immune health. And that's one of the reasons why we talked, I talked before about how exercise is good for brain health and it's also good for uh, 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 immune health. And that's probably because immune health and brain health are intimately linked. Obviously this is very much part of the questions about how is COVID-19 and people's response to COVID-19 affecting their brain health? How does a history of long-term alcohol abuse affect risk for cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease? Uh, Rutgers is a, has a major leading center for alcohol abuse um, and we work with them uh, to try to study in those people who have a long-term history of alcohol abuse, how is that affecting their brain health? Um, and that's an important, not only for, for treating, um, but also uh, sort of understanding what are some of the consequences of, of excess alcohol. So that gives you sort of an overview of some of what we're planning. Oh, I'm sorry, one last thing. Uh, uh, sorry, two last things to get to nine. So we're interested in, in interventions, not just in studying people, but improving them. Uh, but we don't do drug trials. We look at non-pharmaceutical interventions, most of which have been uh, exercise in the past. We're also gonna begin doing some, eventually some sleep intervention studies but there's some very exciting new directions in brain stimulation. So, so non-invasive, not sticking electrodes in the brain, but, but either just sort of little bits of, of current um, or just sensory stimulation um, that can change your brain waves. So if you have a little electrical current that's sort of alternating on, on, on the scalp or you have lights that are flickering, your brain, that actually will change the, the frequency at which your brain is oscillating. And there's a particular frequency called gamma waves or 40 times a second. Um, which has been associated with improved cognition and reduced risk or progression of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a study that we're just beginning. It's in collaboration with Harvard Medical School. And uh, uh, we hope sometime over the next year, obviously it's been delayed by COVID, but to begin to ask, can we begin to improve people's cognition, not just by exercise or by sleep, but by sort of stimulating their brain from the outside with sensory stimulation. Um, and lastly, and I mentioned before, we're interested in working with people in public health and sociology and social psychology. Uh, what are the facilitators and barriers to older African-Americans participating in aging and brain health research? 
Can we look at what we're doing? Can we look at what's been successful? Can we look at places where we haven't been as successful, for example, in recruiting men and, and learn to sort of not only improve our own ability to, to recruit older African-Americans into our study, but to, but to communicate through publications and other presentations to other sites for aging research around the country so that they can improve their recruitment of African-Americans. So those are nine of the key questions that will uh, identify what we're gonna be doing in the coming year. And uh, I hope that some of the, uh, the students and others will uh, decide some or all of this is exciting and wanna join the lab. So that brings me to the end. Uh, it's a little after 12.07, so it was exactly one hour. Uh, my website, uh, my email uh, is all there.